All right, we are now recording. This is the first debate between Jackson Snyder and Onia Carlson. We hope to do more in the future, depending how this one turns out. And uh, I'm going to have uh, I'm, I'm going to start my I'm, it's going to start with me, and I am going to do the uh, my opening statement. Now we're, we're giving a maximum of five minutes for the opening statements, but I might end it sooner than five minutes. And so if I end my opening statement sooner, I'll just let you guys know, and I'll end the timer, and then I'll hand it over to Jackson to, to do his opening statement. So, one second, all right, I'm going to set the timer now to five minutes. All right, the time is starting. So, my position, which I will seek to be defending in this debate, is that Paul and James, when they were teaching what they believed was the truth, and they were sharing their views of the scripture, I believe that Paul was actually in agreement with James, just that Paul sometimes worded it in a more complex manner. He focused a lot more on philosophical ideas, whereas James was more of a practical, straightforward uh, approach. And what I, the main approach that I'm going to be making in this debate is I'm going to I'm going to show endorsements which I believe defend Paul's authenticity of a valid being a valid apostle and a uh, in harmony with James teaching so I'm going to show endorsements from his letters from other parts of the New Testament and from other writings uh, early ancient writings and then I'm also going to be using uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls to show because according to Jackson's position the teacher of righteousness in the Dead Sea Scrolls is none other than James at least he has said that in the past his perspective is that the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually focused on James and but there's a problem with that because there I, I have found some writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls which say some things very similar to what Paul says. So the basic idea, the basic concept is if I can show that the Dead Sea Scrolls are saying the same type of language as Paul is saying, then if you're going to reject Paul for using that language, then you're also going to have to uh, reject the Dead Sea Scrolls. But if you reject the Dead Sea Scrolls as being contrary to James, then that's the entire that's the entire argument because Jackson uh, suggests that, for instance, the Pesher Habakkuk uh, is actually a veiled description of Paul uh, being a a heretic, if I understand his position position correctly. And so, but if the Dead Sea Scrolls are teaching the same thing that Paul is teaching, then. Uh, then the Dead Sea Scrolls would be invalidated on the same uh, basis. So that's going to be mainly what I am, um, what I would be seeking to prove in this debate. And then I will also be, uh, I have no idea what Jackson's going to be saying for his position, what he's going to try to throw at me. So I will also be hopefully adequately defending against. Uh, what he says, defending Paul against some of his accusations. But so we, uh, that's basically what my position is in this debate. So it hasn't been quite five minutes yet, but I'm gonna end my opening statement now. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jackson Snyder. So. Thank you, Oni, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I thank you all for coming. Uh, We've been thinking about doing this for quite some time. And as I mentioned before, we're good friends. We've been going around and around about these things. 
in the past, and we are both uh, delighted with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We may see them a little differently. And that's pretty much my opening statement. I'm just glad to be here, and I'm taking the uh, opposition to Paul being uh, loyal to the teachings of James, and I will indeed use the Dead Sea Scrolls. And since already these have been brought up, um, I'll take the rest of my time here, five minutes, just to mention the Dead Sea Scrolls in regards to Paul and James. Primarily, the scroll that is in the New Testament um, purview is the Habakkuk Pesher, as he said. If the teacher of righteousness is, as Onia said, James the Just, then uh, the lying spouter is Paul. And we find this succinctly in the New Testament as we go through, especially 2 Corinthians, over and over and over again. We find Paul saying, I do not lie. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. And he also says, as far as spouting, um, let me boast. Oh, I'm foolish to boast. I shouldn't boast. Over and over, many, many times. And here we find the caricature of Paul as the lying spouter in the Habakkuk Pesher against the teacher of righteousness, who is purportedly James, who is called the lying spouter and is accused continually throughout the Habakkuk Pesher, the Psalms Pesher, etc., as being the one who stood up in the midst of the congregation and um, relieved himself of the Torah entirely and said he was going forth out of the Torah. He's also known in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the one who left us or the Torahless one, or the one who is after the smooth neck. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, yes, we can say that Paul is definitely in there, and we can say that Paul does teach some that are in the scrolls, but he's marked out. He's a marked man, and Robert Eisenman's the one that pretty much proved that the Pesher is a part of the New Testament canon and really should be. So I just would mention that in the little bit of time I have left. I'm supposed to have 10 minutes to make a case now, I believe, since my opening is done. Now, the five minutes left? Yes. All right. I just want to say also, while, while we're at it, uh, I believe that Onia Carlson has got one of the finest minds for scribal work and one of the farthest reaches of apocryphal literature that I have ever known. And I have a lot. I owe him a lot because he's taught me a lot in this last year and a half. And especially with his exegesis on the Temple Scroll, it's just it's tremendous. So um, it's a, just an honor to be with him today, even though I don't agree with him. All right, I, I, I talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we almost have to put them aside. A Pesher, a Pesher is a commentary. Okay, so we have Paul, James, Yahshua, we've got Ananus the priest, we got the Romans, we have the Herodians, we've got Israel. We got all the trappings of uh, AD 60 in this Habakkuk Pesher, Habakkuk commentary on Habakkuk, whereas the people of James the Just, the righteous teacher, who is by this time dead, being killed by the high priest, have talked about um, that whole history of that time in couched secret language. But as Eisenman would say, if the shoe fits, then uh, you own the shoe. The, the only place that Habakkuk Pesher could possibly fit into history is about 60 AD or 65 AD, first century. And the characters there are James, Jesus, Paul, Ananus, and a whole host of others. Now, I want you to go to a website, if you would, where I'm going to make my, my argument. And I've got it on here. Uh, if you can see it, I don't know how to get to people who are not on here. The website's blocked. Oh, yes. All right. Well, it's because we don't have a moderator on this one. Let me give you what it is. You can go out there if you want. I wish you would. It's jacksonsnyder.com. Well, you got to give me time to get, since I'm blocked. i got to have some time to get what my website is. This is outside the 10 minutes. jacksonsnyder.com, S-N-Y, dash, Yah, Y-A-H, please turn your mic off, Arby, slash 2014, slash H-N-R, no, I've got to get the website up first, slash debate, slash, oh, dot, I'm sorry, H-T-M, one more time through, as soon as I get the website out to you, because I've got to have you follow it, then I, I can start that 10 minutes, I'm just blowing right now, jacksonsnyder.com, slash Yah, Y-A-H, slash 2014, slash H-N-R, slash debate, dot H-T-M. All right, I can't give it again. All right, I have to get it myself now. All right, you can start the 10 minutes now. All right, first we're going to start with the Epistle of James, right at the very top, first, first chapter, first verse. Yaakov, a servant of Elohim, and I, the master Yeshua, Amashiach, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Well, we're going to assume that this came from the Hebrew or Aramaic language. In that language, the word for dispersion is galut or galat. 
depending on how it's used in a sentence, he says greeting. Now we're going over to Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul is saying, Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man. Please uh, take a look at that, because we'll find throughout this, Paul does not get his shmikah from anybody, but he claims a heavenly shmikah. But through Yeshua HaMashiach and God, actually I should say Jesus Christos and Elo, and uh, Theos the Pater, who raised him from the dead, because Paul writes in Greek, and all the brethren who are at, with me to the churches at Galatia. The point I'm making here, same as the scholars will make. James and Paul are writing to the same place, to the church at Galatia or the church in the dispersion. It's the same word, Galatia in Greek and Galut in Hebrew. Now, in Galatians, we have Paul speaking of my gospel, if we want to look down a little bit. Whether one can believe Paul's gospel or not is a matter of whether one can believe Paul or not. We must divorce Paul from Luke's writings entirely, which were concocted 30 years after Paul's death from the antiquities of Josephus. No place does Paul talk about a Damascus Road experience or anything like that. What we are trying to find in our walk of faith is the beginning of the gospel of Yahshua HaMashiach, son of Elohim. But what we find in Galatians 1, 6-9 is Paul saying, I marvel that you, in the dispersion, you in Galatia, are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Messiah to another gospel. If there was another one, some that trouble you, who would pervert the gospel of Messiah. Later on, he's going to tell you who is perverting the gospel of Messiah. But he says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than, was, than we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Again, let him be accursed. Note again, James and Paul are writing to the same people. Obviously, Paul is countering the people from James, and we find that in verse 11. When Kephar came from Antioch, I opposed him to his face, etc., etc. Let me see. So he gives Peter the Dickens because he won't sit anymore with the Gentiles once the people from James comes down. Uh, before certain men came from James, he ate with Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. That's James' party. Barnabas left. Kephar left, all those of the Jews left the table, and then Paul is very miffed about this, but it's Paul's gospel that comes to the fore here, not the gospel that comes out of Jerusalem, the gospel of James. We could talk about James being the successor to Yahshua, having hands laid on him and being left as the mavaker of the entire movement throughout the world, and that Paul has in several places said that he did not have to answer to anybody but that his gospel came from somewhere else, which includes the keeping of the Torah, faith and works. So I'm looking through Romans a little bit, and Paul is talking about Gentiles who have a law unto themselves, even though they don't have the law. In Galatians, he talked about the law being a schoolmaster. But if one does not have the schoolmaster, how can the one be converted and then have the law in their heart, that is in their mind, if they never had it in their heads? He says their consciences confirm this. And as a matter of fact, in the Corinthian church, we find the confusion that comes from that place comes from this kind of a gospel where one's conscience is one's guide instead of the written Torah. We can go on and on. He talks about the mystery kept silent concerning his gospel. And remembering that if we don't conform to his gospel, we may be accursed. And if anyone, even an angel, would bring you another gospel besides me, let him be accursed. So he is directing what he's saying to James, and I'm going to prove it if I have time. How much time have I have left? Okay, good. Let's go down a little bit to some parallels. If we take the epistle of James and we take Galatians, what we find there is an incredible, incredible parallel. As I mentioned, they're both writing to the same place. I'm going to prove that now by going verse from verse through both the epistle of James and the Galatians and showing you some major um, correspondences between verses. Look, for instance, at the parallels. James, servant of Elohim, and Yahshua HaMashiach, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, they already did that. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men. And we see Galatia and Galut there just in, in the first verse. Okay, James comes from the Lord, Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle does not come from men. He wants to make sure that he is known not to have come from James because he is addressing James here, just as James is addressing him. Jump down a little bit. 
You can study this when you want to, if you'd like, but right now I'm just going to try to find a couple places here. Verse 10 of James, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not kill. But if you do not commit adultery but you kill, you become a transgressor. He's talking about doing all of the law, not just part of it. So speak and act so as those are to be judged under the law of freedom. He calls it a freeing law. He's not talking about the Gospel of Paul here. He's talking about the Torah. Can his faith save him without the works? And on the other side, in Paul's part of this, in the, of the parallel, a man is not justified by works of the law, not in any part, but through faith in Yahshua the anointed, and we have believed in the anointed Yahshua in order to justify by faith and not by works of the law. Next one, 20. This is the important one. I've got two minutes to do it. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, not me, but Christ liveth in me. He says that he died. He was crucified. Paul doesn't live anymore. The spirit of Yaakov's brother has come out of the dead man on the cross and come into Paul and now lives inside of Paul. And Paul says that he is but a shell of a man. Nevertheless, I live by the, by the spirit of Christ in me. He is a walking shell with Christ living in him. And he calls others unto him because now Paul has become the Gnostic Messiah with the Christ spirit that's come into the hollow man. Now what does James say to that? James knows all about this. It's his brother. It's the spirit of his brother. Do you want, do you want to be shown, you shallow man? James says in the parallel. But that word shallow in the Greek means empty man. You empty man. Paul has become an empty man because he's emptied himself out and claims that the brother of James who died, spirit, now lives in him and that the only way he lives is by the spirit of James' brother. What in the world would you think if you were James? Would you think that he was teaching the same gospel as you? Even James never claimed such a thing as that. And then there's the matter of works righteousness, and faith, which you already know about. Time's up for me. Thank you for listening. Sorry I yelled so loud. I get excited. All right. Don't start the timer yet. But uh, so now what we're going to be doing is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, critique what he just said. But I only get five minutes to do that. And then after I critique it, then he's going to get five minutes to reply to my critique, uh, if he has anything to say to defend against if I if I say any things which try to poke holes into his stuff. So I'm going to start the five minutes now. So in Jackson's uh, what, what Jackson shared with us, there was a lot of I noticed a lot of uh, reading into uh, the, the, these uh, letters. There was a lot of speculation, and there's not too much to go on, uh, and so he's filling in a lot of uh, a lot of the gaps that uh, these writings don't uh, give us. Like for instance, we only see one side of the conversation. Like when Paul writes his letters, it's only one way. We don't say we don't see why he was writing them. Like if they wrote him first, things like that, uh, and then. Uh, he, like for instance, he he tries to put a date on on for James' letter, uh, and he suggests that James' letter comes first. Uh, however, that seems to me to be complete speculation. And from my perspective, it seems more likely that uh, that uh, Galatians came first, and then people interpreted what Paul was saying in a certain negative way. That works don't have to be done, and then James wrote his letter and specifically uh, was addressing some of what the in misinterpretations of Paul's words were, and he was correcting the false understanding that people had. And maybe I can't prove that that's the correct order, but I don't think Jackson proved that James was written first, uh, and then that Paul was writing against James. I don't think he clearly established that. Um, then I also want to say synchronicity, similarities, uh, I have seen examples in real life, uh, I've done research online, where, for instance, identical twins, there are many examples of identical twins living 
very similar lives. There's this one guy, I remember, uh, they both were separated at birth. They were named the same name by their uh, adopted parents, but they, the parents did not know each other. Uh, they like, they did so many things the same. They even ended up marrying the same, uh, they married a woman with the same first name, and then they both divorced that woman, uh, their, their wives eventually, and they both remarried a second woman, and the second woman had the same name as well, uh, the same first name. And they, there was many examples of identical twins having major similarities. Uh, but the fact is that these similarities uh, were, there were, there was a relationship, but you have to be careful of what caused the similarities. Uh, so I agree that there is a relationship between Paul's uh, letter to the Galatians and James' letter uh, to to the believers, but uh, there could be so many different possibilities of interpretations, and he kind of assumed a lot of these interpretations. And like for for one thing, uh, Paul speaks about another gospel, and in, in Galatians, and he actually says if anyone, including myself, Paul was actually talking about himself. He says. Uh, if any man or if anyone preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. In the verse prior, he said, uh, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which I, no, not I, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So he's saying, if I'm preaching to you something if I or anyone else, even an angel, am preaching to you something different than the gospel that was first preached to you by all the apostles, then let him be accursed. He's including himself because he says we. Even if we uh, preach uh, another gospel, uh, let that person be accursed. And um, the, the conscience law, the, the law of Moses in De Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, it actually says that don't, uh, if someone says you have to go across the ocean or into the heavens to receive the law, don't listen to them. The law is in your heart and on your mind that you may do it, that you may obey the law, and that you may have life. Uh, and so that is an endorsement of the, the law being written on our hearts and that we don't need uh, the book of the law to know the, to be uh, saved or you know, to be righteous enough. We can actually, if we perfectly follow the spirit of truth, and it can be on our minds, uh, and in our hearts. And now some of the other things that Jackson said I'm going to address in uh, my presentation of my evidence. And now my, my five minutes is up, so thank you. I think it's a response to critique five minutes. Uh, first of all, dating, dating. I'm an expert in dating, but I don't have to rely on my own expertise to do that. I've been doing it a long time. The date of James' letter is dated by James Robinson, the top guy in the business, at 50. Eisenman, our friend, dates it at about 50 or 60. Kenneth Hansen, University of Florida, dates it at about 55. Schoenfeld, Hugh, the uh, pioneer of the Hebrew Roots movement, dates it at 45 to 50. All right, so I, as far as the dating of the James letter, it's not the old scholarship anymore where it's 150, 200. Now we're back to the square where we are working in the first century and during the time of the Habakkuk Peshia. Second of all, regarding those Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there's nobody that can be called a, a line spouter, especially when you read 2 Corinthians and you read the letter of Galatians. And if that's a New Testament text, as many are saying these days, there's nobody that talks about lying, spouting, and boasting like Paul, nor fits the historical profile in such a way. And nowadays, it's pretty much taken for granted that the Habakkuk Pesher is about Paul and James. I've got teachings on that if you like. Paul says, if you listen to another gospel, except the one we preach, he's using the professorial we there, speaking of himself. How can somebody preach a gospel different than he himself preached when he preached it? Professorial we. If you ever went to college, you know all the professors say we, speaking of themselves. Um, also, the law cannot be installed in the heart. 
until it's first learned by the eyes. Look, Jews grew up, Israelites grew up with Torah, and when they were converted, it was written on their hearts. Gentiles, on the other hand, people like us, we don't know anything about the Torah. I think the biggest proof of what I'm saying is the Christian faith, for instance. They all say the Torah is written on their hearts. They all do, and they're all spiritually filled, and they're all converted, but they don't keep Torah. What better proof could you have but that which is staring at you in the face at all the time? So th that's my uh, defense against that particular rebuttal, and I uh, thank you. I'm through. Thank you, Jackson. I appreciate that. I wish we had longer time because I would have liked to have been able to. Uh, I'm not starting the time yet. I'm just saying I would have been able to like uh, to have responded a little bit more to some of the things that he said uh, but uh, there wasn't enough time there was only five minutes in in that critique but so uh, it is now my turn to do the the uh, my presentation of, of my evidence that I have found and then I'm going to uh, let Jackson critique and then I'll respond to the critique so let me one second. All right, I'm beginning the ten minutes now. So my main position is that if all uh, all the believers uh, endorse Paul as a true brother and faithful, then on that principle, we should also uh, we should believe these people. Uh, it's basically on a principle of authority. So, if, for instance, if the Bible says something, then we believe the Bible. If it if it's if it's divinely inspired, then we can trust it as authority. It's the same line of reasoning. If true believers who are reliable, we consider them divinely inspired, or maybe not divinely inspired, but uh, wise wise men who are righteous, uh, if they endorse someone then that person is most likely to be a valid person and so uh, I also want to note though that many of Paul's letters were not actually written only by Paul uh, for instance first Corinthians uh, first Corinthians and second Corinthians were written by uh, excuse me first Corinthians was written by Paul and Sosthenes second Corinthians by Paul and Timothy almost all the letters were written by Paul and Timothy uh, first and second Thessalonians Paul Silvanus and Timothy uh, and then Galatians was actually not written by Paul only but it was if you read in the beginning of the letter it says Paul and all the brothers with me to Galatia so uh, I wanted to mention that and then also there's endorsements in many of Paul's letters uh, for instance in in second Timothy 4 you see he says, greet this person, greet this person, and uh, this person greets you. This implies that they are on good terms with each other. Paul wouldn't say, this person greets you if they hate each other or are enemies. Likewise, you know, uh, he wouldn't say, greet this person if they're not in harmony with one another. So you're going to find that almost in all of his letters near the end. You're going to find the endorsements, and there's a lot of people he lists. Uh, Romans chapter 16 is one of the best uh, endorsements of people. Uh, he has a huge list in Romans chapter 16 of the, of the people who, who he tells you greet those people because I'm in harmony with them and these people greet you too. And uh, so and one of those people is Hermas and it is very likely that the Hermas that Romans chapter 16 references 16 verse 14 is actually the author of the Shepherd of Hermas, and that was considered scripture in the earliest copies of the Bible. It's in the Codex Sinaiticus, and uh, so he's greeting Hermas. Hermas is on good terms with Paul, uh, so that's a uh, connection right there. Also Luke uh, and some others too. Now, uh, what's very interesting is First Clement. Uh, all scholars agree that Clement. Well, not all scholars, but the vast majority of scholars agree that First Clement was truly written by Clement. And we have other writings that Jackson values a lot, the Nazarene Acts, as he calls them. Uh, th these uh, in speak of uh, Clement as Peter's faithful disciple and James' faithful disciple. 
and they were they were close James Peter and uh, Clement but in this very letter of Clement written by this man Clement uh, we see this in his letter first Clement uh, chapter 5 he says not to dwell on upon ancient examples, let us come to the most recent spiritual heroes. Let us take the noble examples furnished in our own generation. Through envy and jealousy, the greatest and most righteous pillars have been persecuted and put to death. Let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles. Peter, then he talks about Peter, then he says, Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee, and stoned. After preaching both in the East and West, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith. Having taught righteousness to the whole world and come to the extreme limit of the West and suffered martyrdom under the prefix. Thus was he removed from the world and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience. To these men who spent their lives in the practice of holiness, there is to be added... Oh, so he keeps going. Uh, then elsewhere in First Clement, chapter 47, he says, Take up the epistle of the blessed Apostle Paul. Well, according to Jackson Snyder, he's the cursed Apostle Paul. But So, the blessed Apostle Paul. What did he write to you at that time when the gospel first began to be preached? Truly, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he wrote to you concerning himself and Cephas and Apollos, because even then parties had been formed among you. So we see right here, uh, Clement, the very man who was uh, trusted by Peter and James, their successor, he's endorsing Paul. Then we have, uh, we have in First Clement, we have this. He says, uh, being, he's, he's speaking, and then it says, being justified by our works and not our words. And then a couple chapters later, he says, uh, he says, um, let's see here, we too, being called by his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified by ourselves, nor by our wisdom, or understanding, or godliness, or works, which we have wrought in holiness apart, but by that faith through which, from the beginning, uh, and then whatever. Uh, so, we, we have here, in this letter of Clement, he says in one place, we are justified by our works, and then, to, Two chapters later, he says, we are not justified by our works. Is he contradicting himself? Or rather, language is very diverse. There can be multiple meanings. Are we justified by works? Technically, we're not. We're actually justified by righteous works, because works can be sinful works, too. So when we say justified by works, it's implied righteous works. Uh, and when Paul says we're not justified by works, there may be a nuance of language there that is implied, but not stated. This is, uh, so let me give an example. Uh, in modern English, when we say want, it means we don't want that. Get that away from me. In older English, when we say want, it sometimes means uh, uh, something that you do want. Like uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Psalms, uh, David said, uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the older English, that means I shall not be lacking. I shall not be without. In modern English, it sounds like David is saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't want him. Which is obviously not what he's saying, but language has many nuances, and I suggest that this is the same for uh, what Paul said, and how when, when Paul was speaking about faith and works, there were nuances in his language. We've got 2 Peter chapter 3 endorsing Paul, but we know that most people who reject Paul don't believe that was actually written by Peter. Uh, then let's see here. We we've got uh, we've got uh, there's not a lot of time left. Uh, let's see. Romans chapter two. If you read Romans chapter two, you see basically he says we have to keep the law and um, we're justified by the law. He says uh, we will be judged. All who sin are, will be judged uh, for their sins. It's not the hearer of the laws. Uh, it's not the hearers of the law which are justified in the sight of God, but it is the doers of the law who will be justified. That's what Paul says. It is the doers of the law who will be justified. Verse 13 of chapter 2 of Romans. And then we've got, uh, we've got, you know, Paul says, on the contrary, we establish the law. And then uh, he, it says, um, 
1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, I'm going to show you how Paul actually teaches we have to stop sinning to be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, he gives a list of sins, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord. Right? And then that goes on. Galatians says the same thing. Chapter 5, uh, he speaks of the, uh, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, he gives a list, and says, of Which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and then he gives the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and then he says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, he says, Each one, let him examine his own work. Uh, each one must bear his own load. And then he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, his works, that is, that he also will reap. For he who sows to his flesh, sins, that is what he means, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, meaning righteousness, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, uh, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Uh, so, there were other things I was going to say, but I ran out of time. So now I'm going to give the opportunity for Jackson to uh, to give his critique. Thank you all. Great job, brother. I have a few comments. Only has started out with an appeal to authority, which if you've taken one college course or one year of college, the first class you're going to have to take is logic. Uh, appeal to authority is illogical. Appeal to the masses is illogical. It doesn't make any difference how many people believe something. That doesn't make it true. And finally, his appeal to the Catholic fathers of the fourth century is most illogical at all of all. To think that because it's in the New Testament canon that it is true is, to me, well, it would have been tenable 20 years ago, but not so much today. As far as Paul's writings, yes, Paul was considered to be blind. Paul had to use his secretary, he used various ones. All his brothers were Greeks. All his brothers were Gentiles, including his endorsements that Oni had talked about. I challenge you, go through all his endorsements in every book, all his views. Find one Hebrew in. Find one Hebrew. You get 13 golden emeralds if you can, because you won't be able to find one. Some of the names in there, Epaphroditus, the secretary of Nero, Nero and the murderer of Nero. Rufus Pudens, a Roman senator. Herodian, that is the mother of Salome, the, the woman that danced before Antipas for John the Baptist's head. Claudia and Linus in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy 4. Two Druid, a princess and a prince. Aristobulus III in Romans 16. Aristobulus III was Herod Agrippa's brother. Seneca, he writes to Seneca, Nero's guardian for 13 years who read to Nero Paul's letters and exposed all those Greeks and Romans at the end of the book of Romans to Nero for him to round up when the time came for him to set fire to Rome. Next, Clement. Let's talk about Clement. He was the fourth pope of Rome. The Church of Paul was right down the street. If you look at the history books, there were two Flavius Clements, at least. There were two of them. Check and see. Onio's got the wrong one there. Next, Paul changed his theology from the Romans to Galatians. He said, I'm through with this. I'm going to the Gentiles. When in Rome, I'm going to do what the Romans do. To every Roman, I'm a Roman. To a Hebrew, I'm the Hebrew. And then he has to come back, as recorded in Acts 21, to the temple to do obeisance to James and the elders by shaving his head and the heads of these other guys. And they already knew him by reputation that he was teaching Gentiles that they did not have to keep the law anymore. Colossians, citing Colossians, that's a pseudo-Paul letter, that it's a Gnostic letter from one chapter to the other. It's uh, pure Gnosticism, Paul didn't write it. Okay, Paul's lists of sins are not Torah. The 15 in Galatians are not Torah. The ones in Colossians, they're not even his. It's hard to get by Galatians chapter 3 and James' epistle. It can't just be put aside as a coincidence. It is, in fact, a back-and-forth conversation about faith and works that ends up in Paul saying that anyone who preaches the gospel of James is to be accursed. I'm done with that critique. Thank you. I don't need the time.
In fact, I addressed everything he had. I'm going to start it in just a little bit, but uh, thank you, Jensen, for your very uh, infuriating critique. But, uh, <laughs> just joking. But, um, so let me see here. All right, so I'm going to start the five minutes of my uh, of my uh, response to his critique now. Uh, so he first of all he he talks about the uh, appeal to authority being a logical fallacy, and actually that is not the case. It uh, it is sometimes a logical fallacy, but it's not exclusively or always a logical fallacy. Uh, for instance, we use appeal to authority very often in uh, the court system. Uh, without a, the authority of the witnesses, for instance, then we can't actually prove anything uh, a crime happened. The very uh, foundation of justice is based on this principle of authority. And uh, so the, the uh, fallacy of appeal to authority is more about uh, blind appeal to authority, ignoring the evidence and just saying, okay, well, the authority says it, so it has to be true. First, you have to prove that the authority is reliable, uh, and then you also have to, you have to look into other evidence as well uh, to, to, to see if the evidence uh, reconciles with that authority. The basic approach I do is logic is the chief authority, and then there's a second authority uh, underneath it. Uh, Scripture I, I view as a very high authority, divinely inspired. That's God's words. I'm going to believe whatever God's words say unless it's illogical. If I can prove it's illogical, then I'm going to reject what the word says. But otherwise, I will accept the authority. Uh, I don't believe that is a logical fallacy, uh, but I'll leave to you guys to, to judge that. Now, he mentions 4th century documents. I'm not sure what he's talking about. I never... Uh, mentioned a 4th century document, I cited First Clement, and that is uh, proven to be a very early document. We have church fathers who, who quote uh, from First Clement. He speaks of two different Clements, but uh, that's a uh, an assumption on his part. They very, many ancient writers believe that they were the same Clement. Uh, he makes two different Clements because they can't reconcile with his viewpoint. Uh, I, I really don't see the evidence that this writer of First Clement was anyone other than the true Clement uh, uh, that Peter and James were in uh, harmony with. Um, and then, you know, when, uh, when uh, Paul says, to this person I am like this, and to, to this person I am that, uh, it is, uh, he's not saying he will... Uh, he'll change his beliefs or change his message. What he's saying is he tries to accommodate for differences people have. And uh, he'll try to, uh, you know, as he said in one of his letters, if eating meat causes someone to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. That's the type of thing he's talking about, of, of humbling himself so that he does not uh, cause people to stumble, but that he can bring people to the faith. Um, now, lack of endorsements in, in Paul's letters of Jews, the very likely reason there's so few Jews in his endorsements is probably the case that there were almost no Jews who were converts. If you look, uh, the majority of uh, the, the prophets tell us that the Jews, were, very few were going to convert, whereas the Gentiles were going to be in mass convert. And then secondly, uh, most of the Jews were in a few, like they, they were not in all the churches dispersed everywhere throughout Europe. Uh, there, there were Jews throughout, but they were not in every church area. And uh, and Paul, uh, he, for instance, he did not uh, speak of so-and-so apostle, apostle, Hebrew apostle, greets you, because those apostles were not there to give him that message. They were, they were, the apostles were told to go out into the nations. And so they were gone. All the endorsements that he was giving was from people he received in person who they had close contact with, I believe. Uh, he speaks of pseudo letters of Paul. Uh, I'm not sure why he said that. I mean, I didn't even quote from Colossians, but he mentioned Colossians. I'm not sure uh, why he said that. He said the list of sins that Paul speaks of is not in Torah, uh, but um, I 
the list. I see his sins are in Torah. I see his sins being Torah. He's not going to list all the sins. James doesn't even list most of the sins in the Torah. He barely lists almost anything in the law. I mean, like, he doesn't list the, the main laws of the law. He just gives a general overview. Love, love your brother. Paul says the same thing. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So, uh, Paul gives a huge amount of laws, and they're they're all in uh, uh, Paul's uh, excuse me in in the law of Moses. I have found. And I'm going to speak on the Dead Sea Scrolls in my closing statement. So that was my response to his critique. Uh, now, uh, it's going to be uh, me uh, who is going to be doing the closing statement next. That's the order we established. Uh, and then he's going to be the, the final uh, closing uh, statement uh, for his side. And then after that, we're going to let people ask questions if they want to ask questions. Uh, so I appreciate so much you guys uh, for attending this. I hope you've been enjoying it so far. So let me, uh, I'm just about ready to start. I'm going to begin my, I'm going to begin my uh, closing statement in just a second. All right, I'm beginning it now. So I'm going to read some from the Dead Sea, a couple things from the Dead Sea Scrolls that show that the Dead Sea Scrolls were teaching the same type of language as Paul was saying. Uh, so you can't reject both of them. Uh, I mean, you can't reject Paul only and not the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you have to be consistent uh, if they're both saying the same thing. So here's one example. Uh, the War Scroll says, By the hand of our kings, besides, you saved us many times, thanks to your mercy, and not by our deeds or works, by which we did wrong, nor by our sinful actions. For the battle is yours, and it is from you that power comes, and not from our own being. It is not our might, nor the power of our own hands, which performs these ma marvels, except by your great strength and by your mighty deeds. And then in the, th the Thanksgiving Psalms, which I believe were written by David, we have in column 8. I have chosen to purify my hands in accordance with your will, and your servant's soul detests every work of iniquity. I know that no one besides you is just. Another translation is righteous. And then later in column 9, And in the wisdom of your knowledge, you have determined their course before they came to exist. And in accordance with your will, everything happens, and without you, nothing occurs. These things I know uh, through your knowledge, for you opened my ears to wondrous mysteries, although I am a creature of clay, fashioned with water, a foundation of shame, and a source of impurity, and of, in of iniquity, and, and a building of sin, a spirit of error, and depravity without knowledge, terrified by your just judgments. What can I say which is not known, or declare which has not been told? Uh, and then uh, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, let's see. Community rule. This is the main scene document. Central Dead Sea School document. Community rule. Column 11. However, I belong to evil humankind, to the assembly of unfaithful flesh. My feelings, my iniquities, my sins, there's like a word missing, with the depravities of my heart, belong to the assembly of worms and of those who walk in darkness. For to man uh, does not belong his path, nor can a human being steady uh, his step, since the judgment belongs to God, and from his hand is the perfection of the path. By his knowledge, everything shall come into being, and all that does exist he establishes with his calculations, and nothing is done outside of him. As for me, if I stumble, the mercies of God shall be my salvation always. And if I fall in the sin of the flesh, then the justice of God, which endures eternally, shall my judgment be. If my distress commences, he will free my soul from the pit, and make my steps steady on the path. He will draw me near in his mercies, and by kindnesses, kindnesses set in motion my judgment, he will judge me in the justice of his truth, and in his plentiful goodness all, uh, always atone for all my sins. In his justice he will cleanse me from the uncleanness of the human being and from the sin of the sons of man, so that I can give God thanks for his justice and the Most High for his majesty. Um, and then I want to say uh, Ephesians chapter 5 also has Paul speaking about uh, we have to be righteous. He says, uh, chapter 5, of course, uh, Jackson says this is not written by Paul, uh, but I believe it is. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor co coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give, be giving of thanks. 
For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And then finally, uh, there are no writings uh, attributed to the apostles which speak against Paul. And I have found a writing by Cl uh, Peter and Clement where, where uh, Peter basically says, we thought evil of Paul. We got we got deceived by Paul and thought that Paul was trying to, you know, that he fell away from the faith. But we were wrong. We realized he was not. He did not fall away from the faith, and he was faithful to us. So the closest you can get in extra writings, ancient writings, is that they did have suspicions, but it was proven wrong. So uh, I do know of some documents that speak of that, but there's no documents which uh, condemn Paul. And you would think that there were if that was the case. So that's that's the end of that's my closing statement. Uh, all right, thank thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jackson Snyder, and he will do his closing statement. I wish I would have been able to do uh, more, you know, like had had more time to share some more stuff, but uh, I was un unable to do that. If you have any more questions about uh, some of my what I evidence for what I believe you can do that in the question and answer after or uh, message me on Facebook but otherwise uh, the same thing for Jackson if you have questions for him uh, after he gives his closing statement then please by all means ask him and you can also contact him on his uh, accounts again thank you brother a couple of things I want to mention about Onia because he mentioned a few things about me his perspective comes from a canon of 220 plus books, which despite contradictions, he believes them all to be true, including lots and lots of Christian apocrypha that are nothing more than fiction, which he, he takes from as part of his theology and philosophy. Nobody can do better on filibustering the Dead Sea Scrolls than Onia Carlson. He's the master of the scrolls, no doubt about it. But Paul didn't write any of that stuff that he said. Paul didn't write one word of it. And Paul is portrayed in the scrolls as a lying spouter, not one that is among that group of the scrolls people, but one that is an apostate from it and in several places. As for me, I expect most of you are pro-Paul, and I am too. Paul has some exceptional stuff. He's, he's a genius, and he's probably the most influential person that ever lived on the earth. However, that's not what the debate is about. The debate is about whether Paul was on the same page with James or not. And what you need to know is what James believes and what Paul believes. And the best place you can find that out where they mesh and don't mesh is in Galatians chapter 3 and James chapter 2. Those are what I put on the board for you to study. You can see whether they are of one mind or not and whether Paul, in his dismissal of the circumcision and table fellowship, can possibly be in the same religion as James. Because if James would have done that, he would have been stoned. Now, as for me, I let you know about the Habakkuk Pasher. I let you know that Paul didn't write the Dead Sea Scrolls. I gave you the knowledge to go out and check for yourself in the dispute between Paul and James in those messages that I just mentioned a minute ago, and I dated those for you to the same time. Um, you got to consider my gospel versus his gospel. You got to consider that Paul and James were enemies, that Paul tried to kill James when James was on the temple steps, according to the Clementine recognitions, the same thing that Onia mentioned. Paul hit James with a, a, a stave and knocked him down and broke his legs and left him for dead before Paul got his so-called conversion. And in the Clementine material, Paul is not a friend to James. Not at all. Okay, I told you about the dating of the James letter. I told you about Colossians chapter 2 to read it carefully and see what the theology is there, that it is indeed another gospel entirely. I told you about Paul exclusively in Romans and throughout his scripture talking about 
my gospel as opposed to their gospel or any gospel, including in Galatians chapter 1. I uh, mentioned that the law can't be on the heart unless it's on the mind. The Torah has to be studied. That's the problem with the Corinthian church, is it was Paul's church. And if you'll read the first few chapters, there's every kind of problem in Paul's church because of the idea of the Torah written on the heart. Okay, let's see. I told you about the various people that Paul was writing. He was writing to Seneca, Nero's guardian, to Epaphroditus, Nero's secretary, to senators of the, Ro of the Roman Senate. Do you think that these men would have gone along with the circumcision or gone along with the idea of poverty that James did or the idea of the food laws that James did? Not a, not a way Herodias is going to do that, get circumcised. He's the brother to Herod Agrippa. He lives in Rome. He's royalty, and so are most of those other people in there. And again, it wasn't because there was no Jews up there, converts. There were plenty of Jews up there. That was not Paul's mission. His mission was to Gentiles, and he could not circumcise Gentiles because it was against the law in the Roman Empire to do circumcision. That was a death penalty. It's called the Lex Cornelius. Look it up, please. Check it out. Circumcision was illegal. Would James say, Paul, you can't do but part of the Torah up there? I don't think so. I think they moved away from each other. Not that Paul was wrong. I never said Paul was wrong. I only said what the debate is about. Is James and Paul's theology the same? They're not. Time is up. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Good thing I took my tranquilizer beforehand. You guys, are, we, have to, we have finished the debate. Uh, if you... Some people recommended the possibility of uh, having a question and answer following the debate for um, for however long. Uh, we didn't decide how long it would be, uh, but if you guys are interested in that, you can ask us some questions, and uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to. Uh, okay, Jackson says he, we should do a, a question and answer, not on this, but we will do it on uh, other uh, mediums instead. So that's that's it for today. Uh, thank, thank you all for attending this debate. We hope to do another one in the future. Oh, um, can you guys, uh, can you guys, um, can you uh, tell us who you think won the debate uh, in the comments, uh, comment box below? Uh, if you're interested in, in sharing your opinion on who you believe argued the, the better position. Uh, I'm going to save the recording now. All right, it's saved. I have to. I'm going to convert the audio uh, later tonight, and then I'm going to load it as a video to YouTube, which you'll be able to find. Maybe Jackson can also uh, load it to his sites. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate so much you guys coming, and hopefully we can do some follow-ups in the future. Just want to say thanks again. It was fun. It was low pressure. I'm sorry I was yelling, but I love that kid, and we want to encourage him as much as we can, because with that kind of mind, with his grasp of languages and scrolls and apocrypha, he could go far. He needs your prayers. Pray for him.